Welcome everyone. My watch tells me that the time in Estonia is uh, five o'clock afternoon. Maybe some people will join us a bit later, but uh, we will already start with uh, another data science seminar, which uh, today is dedicated to high performance computing, supercomputers, high performance data analysis, and everything else that is uh, related to these topics. Um, my name is Ular Alas. I work at the High Performance Center of the University of Tartu. I'm not a scientist. I'm also not a system administrator. My work is more related to different uh, high performance computing projects. For instance, we have recently established an um, Estonian HPC competence center that aims to coordinate activities in all HPC uh, related fields uh, in Estonia. And there are other projects as well. Unfortunately, we still cannot meet uh, in a face-to-face -face environment, but life still goes on. We have selected a fantastic set of speakers for you tonight. There will be altogether five presentations. Every speaker has approximately 20 minutes for uh, presentation. And after every presentation, there will, there will be about five minutes for questions and answers. Uh, you know, in order to ask a question, please open the Q&A window in Zoom. Uh, just click the Q&A button that is located uh, next to the uh, chat button in Zoom in between the participants button and chat button. Then uh, a new window opens and just uh, type your question to the Q&A window and click send. And all questions are very, really, very welcome. There are no stupid questions tonight. Uh, today's seminar will be recorded. Uh, the recording will be uploaded to YouTube probably. And we are going to share the link later with you. What else? Uh, there will be no official coffee break tonight, but you are welcome to have uh, coffee, tea, or any other drinks anytime to, you wish to have. So I think that is enough for the short introduction. Let's get serious now. Uh, our first speaker tonight is Oetterik Opkaup. What is the system administrator <clears throat> at the HPC Center of University of Tartu. He has been working heavily at the HPC Center for four years and he's very experienced. He mainly specializes on user support, cluster hardware, and uh, data storage. And what is going to tell us how <clears throat> huge amounts of data are actually stored and processed. Please, at approximately 130 people are waiting for your talk. The stage is yours. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I can't see the chat, so we'll have to rely on um, pure guess. 
Anyways, uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm going to give you a small look into how a high performance computing center works or what's, uh, what's in the kitchen side of uh, large scale data processing and uh, how the data is um, stored, less on that. Um, quickly about me, um, I've been dealing with mechanics, electricity all the way since my childhood. I started uh, opening tractors when I was six. And uh, now for the last uh, six years, I've been mainly working with computer systems. And for about three and a half to four years, uh, I've been working in the University of Tartu as a systems administration uh, for the high performance computing center. What I do here at work is basically everything, um, except for the web services. I manage hardware, software, services, um, high level technical user support. This involves, uh, they are taking pictures outside. Um, higher level technical user support usually involves writing custom solutions to problems, making, uh, yeah basically anything custom. I also keep the HPC cluster in order um, so that it works optimally so that everyone else, for example, the next three talkers can do their data analysis. I have to keep all the hundreds of small pieces uh, in working order in order to compute. I also do basic maintenance upgrades, setting up, if new hardware comes, many of you might have seen me in the Delta server room behind the glass. Uh, and uh, I do a little bit of everything else as well. So basically everything. Um, a little bit about the University of Tartu High Performance Computing Center. So the official birthday is on the 9th of May, 2008. Um, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, it was Rector Alar Karis who wrote uh, on the first official document. And the first computational cluster contained uh, 1.3 terabytes of uh, RAM storage, nine terabytes of uh, hard disk storage, and a little over 330 CPU cores. Since then, we have grown quite a lot. Uh, I'd say it's about the 200 to 300 fold increase in some pieces of computing power. Uh, the, somewhere in the next slides, there's actually better numbers for this. And what we do is we basically help uh, large projects or institutes or organizations um, process their data. We offer the computational resources, we offer technical expertise, and we do this mainly for the university, but also there are some private organizations as well. As well, we maintain a plethora of extra services that are needed, documentation, websites. Uh, so we really are a, an IT department inside the university as well. And if anybody is more interested in uh, the history, uh, Ular here wrote a nice article into the university uh, not mailing list, but uh, anyways, uh, the link is available at IAGRIUTE. It's quite recent, about a month old, and uh, Ular also did a small interview in uh, the radio, National Radio Kuku, which you can listen uh, more about the history of high performance computing, especially here in Tartu. We also collaborate mainly in the European Union, um, but also in Estonia. So in 2014, the Estonian Scientific Computing Infrastructure Project started. And the goal is uh, to today to unify all the computational resources in Estonia, the expertise and um, melt them together into something that's manageable for the user. Uh, and one of the end goals is a unified uh, self-service portal or a cloud, uh, something similar to Amazon Web Services. And we are slowly working towards that. The collaborators now for the uh, ETIS project or the Estonian Scientific Infrastructure Projects are 
of course, us, the University of Tartu, Tallinn Institute of Technology, National Institute of Chemistry, Physics and Biophysics, and uh, of course, the state from heat size model. Uh, currently, that self-service portal manages a few hundred virtual machines, projects in the same neighborhood, and very soon we'll be including uh, access to Lumi, which is something Pekka will be talking at the end of this webinar. Also in 2020, we joined NAIC, the Northern European E-Infrastructure Collaboration, uh, with the goal of uh, unifying uh, our resources uh, with Europe. And now the first question arises is why do we actually need high performance computing? Uh, the easiest answer here is that uh, in the digital age, data, data capacity has grown almost exponentially. So this graph from ResearchGate shows that back in the 90s, uh, we could basically fit almost every kind of storage media on around two to three exabytes of data. This is now a million terabytes. But in 20, 2007, this was already in 19 exabyte range. And uh, when I looked it up uh, last year, mankind produced around uh, 300 exabytes of data per year. So the growth is exponential. And now all the data scientists are also interested in processing and storing that data in a way that's affordable and doable. That's why competence centers and uh, high performance computing centers took over on the large scale data processing to handle this. And in essence, a high performance computing center is just a collection of computers. These are often, often called compute nodes. Um, and they are unified with high speed infrastructure and uh, high speed data storage and access. So in every program, in every part of your computation, you usually have two parts. You need processing power and you need some kind of data storage or memory. And along with the servers and nodes, all the necessary support structures also have to be maintained. Software for scientists, uh, you need to be able to allocate your resources. So a high performance computing center can be taught as a big monolith, but smaller pieces of this structure now have to be given out for singular users to actually run their computations. We also have to support automation, fault detection, error correction. We support users and all of this needs to be accessible uh, for an end user to actually use the computational resource that's hidden away. And you can think of a cluster or a high performance computing center as a hostel. You have a head desk, a reception, you go and ask for an X amount of rooms. Now, booking these rooms, this is up to you. How many do you need? How many guests do you have? We just offer you the rooms itself. And along with that, we offer utilities, local storage, memory, um, disk space. And we manage the booking. So what you do in your own private room, that's up to you. We just, uh, we are the gatekeepers. And uh, our main cluster rockets, as I promised before the parameters, we are at around 10 to 11,000 CPU cores at around 60 terabytes of RAM. So this is many questions on what we include uh, and what we don't. We also upgraded our network to hundred gigabit per second uh, just last year. And with the ever growing need of machine learning, we found ourselves purchasing more and more high speed GPUs for data model training, almost everything. And to accommodate this, we have close to 200 different uh, servers or nodes, each with their own memory and core counts. And unifying all of that with InfiniBand, the high speed 200 gigabit per second link between the nodes, and of course, large amounts of data storage 
close to 10,000 terabytes or 10 petabytes of uh, scratch storage or Mac regular hard disk storage that's high speed. And for backup reasons, we also have around 15,000 terabytes of tape storage. This is now actually divided into small cassettes and each of that, those are about a kilometer long. So if you took all of the tape drives and laid them out, uh, you could actually go from uh, Tallinn to Paris and about halfway back. So it's around 5,000 kilometers of just pure magnetic tape. And now you could think of computations here in the HPC with a pretty simple flow. You have a program, you would like to execute this. So you upload it into the HPC cluster. The cluster works its magic and then you get an output. In reality, it's maybe a bit more complicated for a user with the login step, uh, since you don't run these resources on your own local machine. You submit your job, you wait for your resource allocations, you have multiple nodes, and then you aggregate the output into one singular thing. But for us, it's a bit more complicated. The whole process looks complicated and is complicated. This graph um, is about 30 to 40% of our actual infrastructure, and everything has to be interconnected. Uh, so the whole cluster works as a well-oiled machine that uh, basically takes a program or a job, makes, uh, allocates it some space, it fits into one compute node or multiple, and all of this works in, in sync and 24-7. So maybe uh, the small complexity of this diagram uh, helps you understand if we make some mistakes. Um, and the reasons why to actually use an HPC center in the first place, well, one of the main questions is always data storage, size. Once you get to bigger size of the data sets, you also need more firepower to actually uh, compute through those data sets. So even though modern workstations or PCs are getting quite fast. They have pretty small physical limitations due to their size. We don't really have that limitation since uh, our computers are starting to take uh, full rooms again, like back in the 80s and 70s. There's also the point uh, of uh, taking off the administrative workload from your own computations. You don't have to manage your own hardware, software. If anything breaks, this is uh, now something we already do. And you can, with, you can have a peace of uh, mind by just submitting your jobs and uh, not worrying about whether your power goes out, whether you have enough limits, uh, maybe somebody turns off your computer, internet goes down. We already have the infrastructure in place to do this. And by economies of scale, we also have the space to process multiple large jobs at a time or even thousands of smaller ones. So there is also a factor of time. We also uh, support a large selection of pre optimized software. We have user support for any technical questions or if your program errors, we can take a look at that. And you don't have to also worry about where do you keep your data. It's the hard drive, you are keeping your important scientific uh, raw data. Is it safe? We guarantee the redundancy and the backups uh, of your data. Also a small perk of being a small university, uh, our support can manage a lot of personal contacts. So if you've ever been to Delta, you might have seen some of our uh, team members. And uh, we also drink coffee at, at times. So it's easy to approach us if you have any questions. 
And also there's the other question of um, entry costs. If you're starting on a project, then you have to start worrying about getting the hardware necessary or where to calculate this. Maybe at, during the first stages of your project, you thought you'll be getting two terabytes of data. So you bought yourself a two terabyte disk. But now that one disk isn't uh, enough for you, we can scale these kinds of things up and down dynamically. So what you see is what you get and uh, you don't have to worry about uh, buying new disks, uh, making your own workflows. And you can save time by scaling up your jobs. If your data sets uh, number in the hundreds, but they're all really similar, you can process a hundred of them at the same time meaning you don't have to run them sequentially on one machine and wait for a month to actually get any results. You can scale it up. And of course, there's also the question of hardware limits. So many typical workstations today, we find around 16 to 32 gigabytes of RAM memory. And this tends to be a bit small for some of the newer data sets uh, that people work on. Our hardware limits uh, range from around half a terabyte to ter two terabytes of memory on a single machine. And once your software is capable of scaling up, you could utilize in theory the whole 40 or 50 terabytes of RAM at any given point. And there's also the time you save by setting up your your project. You don't have to figure out what kind of software to install, what kind of operating system. We have already done this for you. So joining is pretty easy. And if you are interested in using the University of Tartu HPC Center, uh, you can always email at us uh, at support at hpc.ut.e or visit our website. Uh, aptly named www.hpcut.e. And how do we do it? People, we, this picture was taken two years ago. We had around 15 to 20 members at that time. And we are currently looking at expanding to almost 30 people. So we have ever grown the last three and a half four years that I've been working. I remember we started out as a bunch of six or seven. Now we are over the four years, we have looked at a five-fold increase in just manpower. And also just an obligatory picture of the server room here in Delta. You can go take a peek behind the glass, and get some information from the table and just look at blinking lights for a while. Thank you everybody for listening. Um, I'm guessing that's the time for questions now. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. What would be the benefit of using university HPC over AWS or other big providers? Very good question. So one of the points is uh, obviously this kind of personal um, contact. Uh, this is something you don't really get in ABS. Uh, in AWS, you get your own virtual machine, which you are the master of. We can provide similar services quite easily as well. The other benefit is uh, cost. So if you are a member of the university, um, the rates uh, don't include taxes. So that's an automatic 20% here in Estonia. Uh, all, all, always something to consider. And the other part is maybe you just want to try out. So for smaller projects, uh, uh, all of this is done on a, on a personal basis, basically. If you are, let's say a doctorate student, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, the costs too much if your computations just need some bits of uh, runtime, but not too much. Hopefully that answers the benefits of AWS. Okay, then my personal question to you. Uh, as you said, you have been 
a Linux nerd for many years. And the question is how many years an ordinary person has to learn Linux in order to use the HPC resources at all? Okay. So there is one bit of learning curve. Uh, all of our systems run Linux. So if you'd like to start with uh, using HPC resources, it's um, basic command line usage is something um, that's kind of needed from you. For the rest, we are updating our documentation on a daily or weekly basis. So we are building a more user-friendly environment. If you're a bioinformatician, for example, you could use one of our um, web frontends called Galaxy to process your data on a more Windows-like and user-friendly drop-down menu. Uh, this is one of the extra services we provide. And what's actually neat about this system is that the jobs themselves, they run on the high-performance computing center. So all it is, is basically a portal for you to analyze. So I would say it takes about two weeks to get set up. Uh, after that, this now depends on how much power you would like to use. So if you're a power user, in some cases, you would like more control. All of these small details take time. But the basic command line usage is almost the only requirement. Can you give some information about the energy consumption of the HPC? So it is a lot. Um, I see Ivar's question uh, down below as well. And how many racks can we fill in Delta? So if I'm not mistaken, the Delta server room is projected to have a capacity of around 100 or 150 kilowatts of uh, power. And um, I'll, I'll take these two together now. Uh, the energy consumption, it's a lot. Um, our, one of our server rooms is looking at uh, nearly 100 kilowatts. And the strategy to minimize it is basically for the cluster part, we can shut off uh, different nodes. But for performance, we don't really keep power saving features when nodes are idle. So we either have them shut off uh, and bring them up automatically so that they don't waste idle power or if they are running, they are running for on full speed because it wouldn't be high performance if we just had uh, throttled machines. Okay, very good. Uh... Oh, and about the rack space, um, uh, I, mi I missed that part. What you see in the Delta Glass server room is only the front side. The actual back side is uh, still semi-empty. We're looking at about 18 racks of the space. So quite a lot. We have expansion room over time. OK, we can answer another question. How do you connect so much RAM? So that's actually a pretty neat question since um, parallelization is uh, a real problem in uh, IT anyways. We use something called an InfiniBand. Uh, so it's a high speed link between uh, our servers. And now InfiniBand has this wonderful um, extra set of features called RDMA or Remote Direct Memory Access. This, what this does is basically circumvent the TCP uh, network stack and allows one machine to directly ask the memory contents of another server. This is also verified by user space levels, so there's no, um, there's no security leaks here because the only way to utilize RDMA is over something like Infin uh, OpenMPI which anyways creates you a new space uh, in each server. And now all of these pieces can interact with each other on another different API called the message passing interface. And in theory, this allows you to scale almost infinitely. So I would say magic. Okay, I think we can take uh, one last short uh, question. Uh, is this 
is the use of this HPC service, is it free for the UT fellows or, or how much do they have to pay for it? So this is now a question, I don't know if I'm exactly the best to answer this, but for most students, so if you are a bachelor student, uh, you're doing your doctorates and you just need, let's say, a few large jobs. Uh, we, these uh, are now built to the actual institute or department itself. So if you are a really small user, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, us giving you a bill of, um, I don't know, 25, 30 euros. If you already have a bigger project uh, and you're looking at more data storage. So for UT fellows, uh, as I said, smaller tasks are, um, are almost built to the university itself. If you are getting more concrete with your projects or you would like um, larger access, uh, then this is also done on an individual level. Um, these kinds of questions are best answered by uh, the department head, Ivar Goppel. Uh, who you can contact that support at hpc.ut.e, email the requirements, and we can give you an estimate. All right, thank you. And once again, there were more questions, but we have to move on. I think uh, all those questions can be sent to our HPC support, and uh, you will get your answers. Uh, we have to move on now to our Next performer, Redik Maggi. Uh, Redik is the professor in uh, bioinformatics at the Institute of Genomics in University of Tartu, and he's an excellent scientist. Hello, Redik. Please, the stage is yours. Um, first, thank you for, for asking me to present, because I don't think I have presented anything in for HPC, usually are taking from HPC and then from computing people not giving anything back. And then I also have to tell that maybe what didn't um, uh, was a bit uh, too, um, uh, we basically they should get much more credit than they're getting and they're doing really, really great job. So we have had very pleasant uh, co-work with HPC and, and um, they are very, very uh, respond very quickly if we have any problems. And, and also we, as, as uh, bioinformaticians are dedicated on, on trying to crash that the cluster, uh, usually we don't um, get it done. For, uh, for a few times we still have had um, a chance to do it. I think uh, like 10 years ago we were uh, queuing like more than a couple of thousands of um, uh, jobs into the queuing system and then the queuing system didn't expect anyone to have so many um, so many uh, tasks and then and, and crashed but uh, since then it has been improved and now it, it's not a problem to to run thousands of tens or tens of, of thousands of, of works in, in 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 parallel so i will now share my screen and uh, Ular, please just uh, let me know like one minute before my run time runs up because I, I don't have a clock and I'm definitely going to talk for a while if, if you just don't tell me. So I'm going to talk on um, behalf of uh, Estonian Genome Center, which is located in the Institute of Genomics in the University of Tartu. And I'm to talking about um, uh, our computational challenges in genomics or what we are actually using HPC for and, and uh, what will be the next calculations or next big things in future. So just um, what is the question or why we are mm, using those uh, servers mm, is um, we are looking for uh, causes of disease and mainly from the uh, genetic side. So we are talking, if we are talking about um, complex disease, which is like any uh, normal um, uh, disease, which is um, uh, prevalent in many people, then it usually have both genetics and non-genetic um, uh, causes. Um, so um, 
non-genetic uh, causes are anything else which is not caused by genes like environment and then also the lifestyle um, factors. And uh, we could basically put all the diseases into, into um, um, uh, and divide them by, by their uh, amount of or how big role of genetics have in them. There are some diseases which are uh, poorly genetics like Down syndrome or hemophilia, which have both have a very uh, large impact of genetics, also like autoimmune disease and everything. And on the other side, um, we have, um, let's say, tuberculosis, which is like bacterial, scurry, which is basically uh, deficiency of, of vitamin uh, C, cancers and, and diabetes. Uh, most of the common uh, diseases, like uh, heart diseases and diabetes, type 2 diabetes, are somewhere in the middle. So they have like uh, half of, um, or half genes, half environment are, 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 are the uh, culprits. One second, oops. So uh, now a bit about genes. So um, we all have a genome, which is uh, quite similar, uh, but still there are some uh, differences. The most common difference in, in human genomes is, is SNP, which is like a, a polymorphism where one single nucleotide has changed. So let's say this is a, like DNA somewhere in your uh, body or in, in your cell. And, and uh, one person has, let's say, G allele or uh, G in this particular nucleotide in this um, um, place. But there are some individuals who have uh, T in the same place. That what makes us different. That gives us different uh, probabilities of getting disease and, and also mm, a lot of other things. Usually those SNPs are P allelic. So there is like uh, only two uh, possible variants and they are uh, mainly used uh, for looking for uh, disease uh, gene uh, associations as um, they are so, so common. There are more than 100 million of them already described. And uh, we can use those SNPs to um, um, run an association analysis. Uh, there are uh, something called a genome-wide association analysis, where we analyze uh, millions of those variants in all or many individuals to figure out which of those SNPs are um, uh, actually uh, causing a disease. And here is a very, very simple uh, um, study design. So we gather people, let's say we have a thousand individuals uh, who are um, uh, diseased or they are carrying some sort of disease, let's say diabetes again. Then we have a thousand people who are controls. And now we look uh, if they are carrying a certain mutation or not. And then if the uh, mutation um, uh, pro, um, percentage is different between case controls, let's say we have one place where you can either have C allele or T allele. Uh, and then the probabilities uh, of C and T alleles are different between case controls. And they could, can do a, a simple two times two test and then see if that uh, variant is, is associated. And then for genome-wide analysis, you will do it for a couple of million uh, times and then look for variants which, which have uh, very, very low p-values. And uh, here is another study plan, which I will skip. Uh, we can do it uh, using Estonian biobank data. This is... Um, uh, Basically, the sternum biobank is uh, just a couple of buckets uh, in, in our cellar. Uh, important part is that we have a lot of information about those samples. Uh, it is a prospective longitudinal population-based uh, database. We have electronic health records and biological materials. It already has more than 200,000 participants, which is um, approximately 20% of adult population of Estonia. Uh, everyone are genotyped. So we have a uh, genotype with um, uh, array. Some are sequenced as well. And we also have a lot of health information for those individuals. Um, I think we have uh, more than 3 million diagnoses altogether for those participants. All the participants have signed proved informed consent, which allows us to do all sorts of science on them. 
as long as we have uh, ethical approval. And uh, it all um, is, is guarded by Estonian Human Genes Research Act, which basically tells what we can do and what we can't do, and what are the uh, rights of, of people who have uh, given their data. Uh, now, uh, I'll get to the computational challenges, which we're seeing right now. So uh, around 10 years, years ago, when the first um, Chivas analysis were made, most of the cohorts were small. Back then, uh, I think we had around 10,000 individuals genotyped as well. And most of the individuals were unrelated. <clears throat> so we didn't have to mm, check for relatedness between individuals. And then we mainly analyzed quite common variants with uh, minor L frequency or where the mutation was uh, present in more than 1% of individuals. And we also had quite balanced case control ratio, which means that <clears throat> as we, um, as an example, let's say we have 1,000 people with disease and 1,000 people who don't have disease. <clears throat> to analyze it, we can use a very simple logistic uh, regression framework. There are different software tools which could be used. And it, it was uh, quite nicely uh, done and, and in, in very uh, straightforward manner. Nowadays, the cohorts um, have increased a lot because genotyping has become feasible. It, it doesn't cost that much anymore. I think it costs around 20 or 30 euros actually to genotype one person if you're doing it in, in a large scale. Uh, so the cohorts or biobanks are more than 100,000 individuals which basically means that there will be a lot of related individuals in biobanks, especially in Estonia, where we have a pretty large proportion of, of adult population genotypes. So we have um, more than, I think, 30,000 uh, parent-child pairs and, and uh, even more uh, siblings in our data set. So quite a lot of related individuals. Uh, we are, can analyze very low frequency variants, variants which are only present in, in a few individuals out of those um, um, 200,000. And also for some uh, traits or diseases, we have a huge case control imbalance. Uh, so we could have like, uh, let's say only 100 cases and then 200,000 controls more or less which basically creates uh, uh, quite a problem for logistic regression, because in that case, it sometimes gives uh, very spurious and, and low p-values, even if there are no associations. So to mm, uh, answer all those problems, the new and much more uh, faster and, and um, um, methods for analysis, and, and we are using uh, generalized mixed models, uh, mixed modeling is, is for taking, considering the relatedness between individuals with saddle uh, point approximation for <coughs> logistic uh, traits and the uh, new, uh, new software tools for it. But uh, statistically, it gets really, really um, uh, much more complicated than just normal logistic regression. And also, um, it will be uh, much um, harder to meta-analyze different cohorts because it used to be only cohorts with European ancestry, where basically if we look at that if, uh, for an effect of a mutation, we could just take um, all the uh, effect sizes which we see in different cohorts and then take uh, a weighted average of those. It is called inverse of variance weighted meta-analyze. And it is very, very simple method. Uh, and then actually we have uh, wrote a software tool for it and it is very well cited. So I'm, I'm very happy about, I think that's my best paper ever. Uh, but now it is uh, getting much more complicated because uh, there are biobanks which are not European ancestry anymore, which is also a good thing because we can find uh, um, much, um, a lot more new uh, genetic associations and then also uh, uh, stuff which we couldn't find only by studying Europeans. But uh, you can't expect uh, all the variants to have the same effect size in different ancestries due to very different regions. So we have to use also much uh, more complex tools for um, analyzing people from different ancestries as well. 
for example, in here, let's say we have uh, people from five uh, different ancestry groups. This is a, um, a supplemental picture from uh, our paper for gestational diabetes. And then we have some cohorts which are from Africa, some which are from America, some from East Asia, Europe or South Asia. And we can see that, let's say each dot is one cohort. We can see that Europeans are clustered together, um, East Asians are clustered together and then so on. It is only based on the allele frequencies or uh, uh, different uh, mutation frequencies in populations. And once we want to do the meta analysis, we have to use a meta regression method, for example, which is also um, one method which we have uh, developed and implemented. And it is also well cited and, and currently a, a tool to use. And then in that case, we are going to use uh, basically um, uh, regression model for, uh, for finding uh, the effect or, or the p-value for each SNP. And then that comes from the intercept from this model. I'm probably not going to uh, get more in, into details. It's, it's, it, it's, it's pretty complicated. So uh, those com um, analyses have uh, given us loads and loads of associations uh, across all human chromosomes. So each of those uh, tiny strips in here is one chromosome, chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, and so on in humans. And each of those dots, different color uh, represents one trait or a group of traits like metabolic diseases, cancers, um, uh, anthropometric traits, and so on. And we can see that basically all human chromosomes and then from start to end are full of different associations with, with different traits. So complex traits are very polygenic. Here is an example of height, human height. And then this is um, something called Manhattan plot, where basically um, the higher the dot is, the stronger is the association in this uh, particular locus is. Uh, in uh, X axis, we have again chromosomes, chromosome one, chromosome two, from uh, the start of chromosome one to the end of chromosome one. And in this axis, we have uh, p values. It's um, minus log 10 of p values. So uh, if the value uh, 500 here means it is 0 0.500 uh, zeros and one, this is uh, so, which means that it is really, really, really low p value, which is. Mm, it means that the association is, is probably mm, the probability of us uh, being wrong when considering this to be an association is, is very small. So we can see that all the chromosomes have those peaks of, of uh, variants which are associated, which basically means that our entire genome affects our um, height. Um, here is uh, another example of type 2 diabetes. And um, we can see that even through the loads of different associations, in here we have um, all genome-wide um, significant associations plotted so that we check how frequency mutation is and how big the effect of it is. Then we can see that most of them are, are uh, quite frequent. So the mutation frequency is, is between 10% and 90%. And But in the same time, the uh, odds ratio or the um, uh, effect size of those variants is tiny. So each of those variants contributes only a tiny bit uh, into your probability of getting disease. So um, if we, for example, genotype this mut uh, mutation or this mutation or those, uh, then uh, just a couple of mutations don't give much information about your probability of getting a disease. However, if you put all of those mutations together and then create the sum of those, then um, it is called uh, polygenic risk score. And that sum already has quite good, um, 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 basically it, it can explain or can um, um, uh, quite well already um, uh, see your probability of getting the disease. So, you will take a lot of, uh, again, there is an example. Let's say we are looking for five locus, locus or five mutations. We have a lot of individuals and we expect that individuals who are carrying more mutations, which will increase the probability of getting disease, um, 
in here you have more people who actually get the disease and in here you have less people who will get the disease. So if you create that kind of risk score by just um, adding up those mutations or adding up and weighting by the effect size, you would expect to get uh, some sort of number which basically tells how big is the probability for you to get the disease. And Eric, I'm sorry you asked me to tell when yeah. there's one minute left. <laughs> It's enough to, to be like five minutes over time. Um, so uh, to create the PRS, we are using um, there are different methods for it. We can use it. Uh, we have uh, own uh, in-house uh, steroid program. I'm not going to talk about it more, but it, it can quite well explain uh, or basically uh, predict the probability of getting disease. Here are some um, examples, for example, in here we have an example for type 2 diabetes. If you are normal weight, then the probability of getting diabetes is very small and it doesn't really matter if you have high or low genetic risk. However, if you are obese, then uh, the um, genes do matter. And in that case, for example, if you have low genetic risk, lower 10%, then the probability of getting type 2 diabetes uh, by the age of, age of 60 is let's say 15 percent in the same time it is almost uh, like 35 or 40 percent in case you have a, a highest um, a genetic risk in, in, in top 10 percent of individuals and uh, we have given some feedback based on it as well in, in genome center and we will uh, are currently building a, a participant portal uh, to uh, to give everyone a, a feedback based on our uh, risk scores there is another example of, of early menopause, which I will skip. And the last part is uh, artificial intelligence. So um, we plan to actually start analyzing our data using uh, different uh, um, machine learning and uh, AI tools. We have several uh, new grants in, in. I'm leading uh, from Tartu side Intervene where uh, we will try to use AI for getting um, even better risk estimations for different um, um, traits and diseases, as well as, as to create a portal where you can uh, uh, validate the, your, your risk models in, in different biobanks, as well as optomics, where we are analyzing uh, type diabetes, where uh, we are going to use imaging analysis and AI to, to analyze those imaging analysis uh, images um, uh, automatically. And then in here, you will basically take a picture of a skin or it's, it's ultrasound picture. And then it will tell how well your uh, capillars or, or blood vessels are doing and what's the probability of you uh, having a type 2 diabetes or type 2 diabetes with, with uh, complications. And also, um, we uh, plan to start uh, analyzing uh, pop smears images for cervical cancer uh, prediction models. And that is led by, by Green Life. Just to conclude, um, complex traits and diseases have substantial genetic component. Uh, genetic risk scores are a good tool for disease prediction because you can do it on them after already when, once person is born. So you, you, it's, it's something which you have uh, also the same in, uh, during your entire lifetime. Um, increasing sample sizes uh, and, and additional complexities which are coming with uh, new data uh, substantially uh, increase the need for, for uh, computing power. And, and we have to put more effort into harmonizing our data and uh, also to make it available through federated data access. And, and that is also something where we hope to um, collaborate with HPC. And that is all. I'd like to thank my small work team and then I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Redik, for this uh, great presentation. Two bioinformatics specialists know as much as doctors. Very good question again. Uh, no, we don't. And, and actually, I don't. Uh, well, we are very dedicated on, on the calculation part. So bioinformaticians are helping actually biologists with informatic part. And, and um, there are like people who are uh, much better in 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 in, um, in the medical side so we are collaborating with basically uh, different doctors or, or doctors from all different fields 
we have also some uh, few medic uh, people with, with medical um, um, medicine background in 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 our institute as well working so we we um, definitely need in our projects some help from from uh, medical doctors great and there is another question from laurie anton mm -hmm. Do you have any compute infrastructure in Genome Center? I think Laurie should know it. Uh, we do have uh, a few servers. We, we have um, two which I bought like 10 years ago, uh, uh, which probably at some time but it will be taken down because um, we, we uh, used to have our own uh, disk space. We had like more than two petabytes of disk space to keep all the genotype and sequencing data. Um, and that has now been uh, moved into HPC, and then I think our cluster, if it's not shut down already, it will be shut down quite soon, which basically means that we will um, waste uh, much less electricity. And then we have uh, two computing uh, uh, clusters as well, both having, uh, I think, around 50 nodes, which we are still using, and we hope to keep uh, still keep using uh, but maybe they can at some time point moved into HPC and then connect it straight into the new uh, hard drives so there won't be any latency. Great. Thank you once again Redik. Mm -hmm. uh, our next speaker is Kaur Alaso. Kaur is a lecturer at the Institute of Computer Science and a founder of the E. QTL catalog project. Please, Kaur, tell us all about this project. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this event. Uh, and I'm really happy to kind of share, share our experiences in using the HPC. And many thanks to kind of the HPC itself for making kind of our work possible because the things we're doing right now uh, would would not be possible if we didn't have access to HPC. I'm lecturer, lecturer of bioinformatics at the Institute of Computer Science. So the topic is, is related to what Redick told, told you before, but I'll try to talk a bit less about kind of specific biological questions and, and more about how we do the computations. Um, so I'm interested, I, so I, I'm interested in, in better understanding what do genetic variants do in human body so that we could use this information to develop normal drugs for complex diseases. You already heard from Redick what genetic variants are. So these A's and G's and G's and T's and complex diseases are, again, as Redick mentioned, there are all of these diseases that uh, have many causes like Alzheimer's or, uh, or cardiovascular disease or type two diabetes, for example. Um, so normally th at this point, I would start to talk to you about uh, what are cells, what's DNA, what's RNA and what are proteins and how it, all of these things come together. But my experience has told me that on these types of events, these slides usually lose me the audience. So I'm trying an alternative today. So I'm trying, I will use a metaphor. So let's say, let's forget about genetics for now. And let's think about what would we do? Let's imagine that we're aliens coming to earth and then we want to learn how do seasons influence nature on earth um, so obviously we need some data we could use image data for example we could collect images uh, from different seasons and then we could try to start figuring this out but the first obvious question is at what scale uh, we could kind of think about at the scale of like trees and plants and forests but we could also go to like a much smaller scale into like specific flowers or we could go bigger scale looking at satellite images and kind of how seas freeze up. So we, to understand the effects of seasons, we need to, we need to work at all of these scales. Uh, uh, and then if we do that, we can kind of, at these scales, we could collect data uh, over seasons. So we would have kind of seasons on the X axis here and then scales, the measurement scales on the Y axis. And then we would, could collect some data, some imaging data. And then obviously now what we need to do is, is we need to extract features that we can then quantify what is changing. For example, we could figure out where are the leaves on these pictures and then we could see how the color of the leaves, leaves changes over time or whether there's snow on the ground, we would detect snow and then we would, would, uh, would kind of quantify how much snow there is. 
And for image processing, it's concept. It used to be very complicated, uh, like ten years ago. But now it's conceptually simple. You just use an image net or some other fancy machine learning algorithm, uh, pre-trained on lots of data, and then you can do this uh, uh, feature extraction and and kind of quantification. Uh, but how do we get this data? Like. Uh, should we send satellites to space? Should we rent the plane to take aerial photographs? Or should we build the fleet of cars that drive around the world and take photos? The first thing is that obviously we should do all of these things because we understand we want to understand the effect of seasons at all scales. So we should do all of these things. And the second obvious thing is that this is very expensive and it's basically not feasible unless you're Google or some very large company. So kind of collecting your own data is, is would not be kind of feasible for most people to kind of look at this. But, but what if the data already exists? What if, 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 if only there was a large database of images that have timestamps so you could extract which season they are from and they have GPS coordinates so you know where they come from, for example. And for kind of image about nature, there are many such databases like Flickr. You could go there, you could search images, you have timestamps, you know where they were taken and you could kind of you could basically get the data for free and now you just have to extract the features and then figure out what are the changes that happen with seasons. Uh, so what do all of these trees have to do with human genetics? Well, first, kind of human biology also exists at different scales. So instead of like subtle images and aerial photographs, we could think about whole body, like things that happen to the whole body level, like diseases, for example. We could go down to different tissues like scan, like skin or fit or, or fat or blood tissue or brain tissue. We could then go down to specific cell types like neurons in the brain or B cells uh, in blood. Or then we could even go to like specific cell states where what happens to the cell when it's, when it's infected with, with um, uh, virus causing COVID-19. Uh, and so kind of we have all of these scales that we would be in principle interested in. And so we could put the scales on the kind of the y-axis of the of the same figure, and then now on the x-axis, uh, instead of seasons, we would now have these genetic variants. Uh, it's a basically kind of a scale of, of variation that we could kind of then see how these genetic variants influence these different human traits at different scales. Uh, instead of like four seasons, we would probably now have ten million variants, but but we can still do it. Uh, uh, and so kind of conceptually, I think it's it's similar. So instead of looking at the effect of seasons on like trees, we could look at, at the effect of genetic variants on, on different human traits. But we then, then I have this other problem, like we have this imaging data that we need to somehow, that the biological data like image data is very high dimensional. So we need to use computational approaches to extract lower dimensional representations from it that we can understand. Like for example, we, from the image data, we would extract leaves and then look at their color. Uh, in biological data that I work with, we usually want to understand what do specific genes do, for example. Uh, but it's a conceptually, again, it's not very different. So images, you have cameras to collect images, and then we have sequencing machines to collect sequencing data. Uh, just that the scales are a bit different. So it's, if you look at the sizes, then probably this would be a more accurate representation. But we still have machines that produce some data. And instead of images, we would get these sequencing files. They're called FASTQ files. But they're sequencing files because they all contain sequences of nucleotides. So we get these files. And these kind of a, from a typical experiment that we work with, these files would usually contain a couple of, couple of million to maybe 50, 20, 50 million rows. Uh, so that's kind of the, the raw data that we're working with. Uh, but again, like the same, the same, the same parallel that we that I mentioned with imaging data, collecting your own data is really expensive. Kind of sending sending planes to uh, kind of hiring planes to take photos or uh, or kind of setting satellite to space is very expensive. The same is true for biological data. It's very expensive to collect it uh, for like for one specific project. But fortunately, again, like there are databases for images, there are databases for biological data where individual labs have already uploaded their data uh, for others for reuse. 
So one such database, for example, is the European Nuclear Data Archive, and there, so notice that this is on the logarithmic scale. And so if you see a linear increase in the logarithmic scale, so everybody since the last year should know that this means that there's an exponential growth. Uh, so, uh, so there's there's basically more and more labs are uploading their data to, to these databases, and then we can just download them and then process those data sets on the HPC here in Tartu. So the data that we are working with right now is is we, we are looking at, at the scale at, on the kind of the scales axis. We're looking at hundreds of different tissues, cell types, and cell states. On the seasons axis, we're looking at around 10 million common genetic variants. And then kind of the samples that we're working with is we have around 30,000 uh, sequencing samples, uh, which are kind of like images, uh, but they are, the difference is they are about five to 10 gigabytes each. So the kind of the raw data is about 300 terabytes. And then from these raw data, we can extract about 500,000 features that we can then quantify across all of these. Uh, 500 features that we can look at at, at different scales uh, and across these genetic variants. Um, so what are they, but there are many kind of computation challenges that come with working with data at this scale. Uh, as the first one is that kind of extracting these features from the data is a multi-step workflow with many dependencies. And so you're kind of, it's, you basically need to do multiple processing steps on the same data. And then when you do this, then you get lots of intermediate data, uh, which can exceed the raw data uh, five to 10 times, and it, it can create lots of temporary files. And so if you go back, if you think about uh, that you have 300 terabytes of raw data, and then we do 10 times more temporary files, then we would be at the order of, of three petabytes of, of data. Um, so it needs to be, so we, it, we need kind of easy ways to control the processing of the data and also process data in patches so that we wouldn't uh, be using too much disk space. And the other thing that comes with this, kind of working at this scale is that the that, that, uh, kind of rare failures uh, rare events will happen almost certainly when you run tens of thousands of processes on hundreds of cores. So things that are super rare that would never happen on your computer, they will almost certainly happen uh, when you run tens of thousands of jobs over a long period of time. So rare hardware failures, for example, or kind of weird things happen. And so the way you design your kind of workflows to process the data need to be robust to these rare events. So basically, if something fails, you need to be able to recover and continue without this influencing your work too much. And the other thing is, the final thing is that we often, we need to repeat our processing periodically uh, because the way kind of, for example, we extract features changes. So we get kind of newer methods to extract features and then we need to reprocess the data. So it, it needs to be easy. It needs to be easy for us to rerun kind of the parts of the workflow that has changed to update the results, for example. Uh, this is kind of a visual representation of one of our, our workflows that we work with. So this is one of, one of the four or five main workflows. So we get kind of some input data uh, and then it goes through some pre-processing steps uh, which depend on each other. So you only, for example, you start with genotype data here, you, you then goes to this process, you get some results back and go to the next process. And then in the end, we have the kind of these final kind of the, the meat of the computing the, the main computation processes. And so all of these things depend on each other. So we can't run these final processes unless we have run all of the previous ones. And if one of the previous ones fails, then, then we kind of need to recognize that and recover and, and continue. And this, this thing, this can be easily parallelized. Uh, so for example, we can we can specify our workflow, how many parallel tasks we want to run. So we can easily run, for example, thousands of, of split the job into thousands of processes and run them in parallel. Uh, so how do we do this? So we use a, a technology called Nextflow, which is a workflow engine, which is basically just a, a simple way of, of kind of, it's a, it's a simple but, but neat way of kind of defining what are the tasks in your workflow? So basically you start by defining what are called processes. So you say what the inputs are, kind of what are the inputs that your process needs? What are the outputs? And then what is this kind of the script, the computation script that you run? And these can be, these are 
basically normal command line commands that you can run on the HPC, but you can wrap them into these processes. And then kind of the key thing is, is that you can link the, process to the processes together. So if you have processes that depend on each other, you can take the output from the first process from here, for example, and make it as an input of the second process. And then Nextflow knows that to be able to run this second process, it first needs to run this first process. And, and then it, it gets the necessary data, it runs the second one and so on. The other neat aspect is that it, it allows you to implicitly parallelize your workflow. So if you, for example, if you need to process multiple data sets, you can just put like a star in the workflow. It knows that there are multiple files and then it will run all of these processes in parallel uh, on, these, on these data. So basically the more kind of samples you have, the more kind of parallel jobs will be submitted to the HPC. And you don't actually have to think about yourself like how the submission process works. It, it handles it for you. The other key thing is, is although kind of Oit mentioned that, that you don't need to worry about installing software in HPC, but we've actually realized that it's, uh, that we want even more independence. We want to have full control of the software that we use and we want to be able to kind of, for example, be sure that we can use exact same version of the software two years or three years down the road. So what we found to be very useful for us is that we can, basically put the software dependencies of each process into a separate container. Uh, so basically like a, so like a Docker or a Singularity container. And then whenever we run this process, this kind of all of the software comes from this, from this container. And this makes the, kind of the, the workflow especially extra reproducible. Uh, and it also uh, allows us to, we found that this over time is actually kind of the small investment in making containers uh, really simplifies things down the line because we are certain that we have this specific version of the software at, fixed at this point in time and we can always reuse it. Uh, and so how does, how does it work with HPC? And so the key here is that the way you know, Nextflow works is that you, as you saw, the process definitions didn't, tell, didn't have anything about HPC and that's intentional because Nextflow completely decouples the, the way you define workflows. So what are their inputs and outputs and which processes you run, you want to run from actually executing that workflow. So Nextflow supports multiple execution environments. So it supports uh, Slurm, which is the one that Dart HPC uses, but you can also exact execute the same workflow using the same containers, for example, on AWS Batch uh, or Google Cloud or on your local machine or any other HPC that have their own uh, systems. Uh, and the way you do it, you just kind of, you basically provide it with some extra bits of, of configuration telling you what, what details out the specific HPC environment that you're, that you're at. And then uh, Nextflow is able to figure out how to, how to do everything else. And so with that, uh, I'm going to end my presentation. And I really would like to thank Nurlan Karimov, who is a PhD student in my group, uh, who actually got me, got me and actually the whole group now invested in Nextflow and using it to streamline, streamline our computation analysis. And if you want to know more about the biological results that we get from this massive processing, you can look at our uh, preprint uh, uh, of the EQTL catalog over here. I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Kaur. A great talk and a great presentation and you also were very punctual in time. <laughs> uh, there is one question in the Q&A window from Niat Taliev and the question is, what advantage would you like to see in technology that would significantly help bioinformatics? Sort of philosophical question. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. So what kind of, uh, so what, uh, what advance would we need? What, what advance would we need? Um, uh, I think, uh, one of the things is that I think I kind of, 
I praised how portable Nextflow pipelines is, but actually are, but actually I think kind of true portability of computational pipelines so that you could seamlessly run a single workflow in different environments. You could take a workflow developed in Tartu and you could ask somebody who have their own kind of HPC system somewhere in University of Chicago, they have their own data set, you would like them to run your workflow and they would be able to do this without kind of having IT support would be, uh, would, would, would be magical. I, th I think we're not quite there yet. So uh, next to gets us much closer, but we're still not there yet where like ordinary users would easily be able to kind of take somebody else's workflows and then can just, just run them on, on their own data. Very good. Then there is another question from Harry Anton who wants to know uh, how much does this service cost to UT research group? Uh, yes, thanks Harry for the question. So the question is about this quay.io service which is used for hosting uh, software containers. So we actually, we used to use Docker Hub but then Docker Hub uh, stopped supporting anonymous access and then we migrated the containers to quay.io uh, and at least at this point when the when the containers are public which all of our containers are so they are completely publicly available then quay.io is completely free for use so you can put containers there and anybody can download them and there are no there are no at least hard co hard coded uh, download limits for software containers there then maybe maybe such question that uh, how often do you get feedback from 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 the users, or or how often do you have to improve this uh, application? So actually, we are kind of at this stage. We are the only you. We are basically we are kind of the only users of the workflow. We have a few people we have kind of now kind of recruit kind of evangelized into using our workflows, but it's it's not the stage where we have kind of massive user base for using our workflows. It's mostly we've developed the workflows to stream our own our own work, and then we have few people who are using this. So, and I think I think it's been uh, it was definitely a bit more complicated in the beginning, but now I think uh, I can confidently say that there are like three or four people who have managed to run our workflows with with me not holding their hands. So on HPC, I think they work well, but. Uh, uh, what we're going to see soon is if we want to, we're going to approach some of our collaborators to use these workflows on their own computer environment, and I'm going to expect problems, but I don't know what they will be. Okay. Uh, another question appeared in Q and A window: Why Nextflow and why not Kafka or Spark? <laughs> uh, it's it's a good question. Uh, the, 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 simple, the first simplest answer is I've never used Kafka, Kafka or Spark. I know that they're also workflow engines, uh, but I've never used them. Uh, Nextflow has some features that are kind of tailored for, for the types of bioinformatics analysis that we're doing. So they kind of, they're, it kind of grew out from a group, uh, kind of from a bioinformatics background. So it's, it's, more, it's a kind of a bit more designed towards bioinformatics applications. Uh, especially like lots of large files and disk that we need to handle. So, so I guess that's the main reason. Uh, uh, but yeah, I haven't looked into Kafka, Kafka and Spark, so I don't know exactly. I know that I don't know any bioinformatics groups using these other technologies, but I know that most companies are using them. So there's, uh, it might just be uh, kind of a culture difference as well. Okay, thank you once again, Kaur. And now I have the honor to introduce our next speaker, Velle Toll. Velle is an associate professor at the University of Tartu. He's studying anthropogenic impacts on Earth's climate, a very hot topic. Please, Velle, we are listening to you very carefully. I work in the Institute of Physics. Uh, I'm a climate researcher. Uh, and I study anthropogenic impacts on climate. Uh, and today I will talk about using HPC for weather and climate prediction. So here in this uh, satellite image, uh, you can see clouds and uh, movements in the atmosphere. Uh, so all these uh, movements and properties of the atmosphere uh, 
uh, are governed by laws of physics, uh, like uh, conservation of energy, momentum or mass. And uh, we can use these laws of physics uh, to predict weather. Uh, so based on a physical model, we construct a mathematical model and uh, by uh, solving the equations describing the atmosphere, we can predict the weather. But now this uh, system of equations uh, that uh, describes the atmosphere, uh, it has no analytical solution and uh, we have to do numerical calculations. Uh, and already a hundred years ago, British uh, scientist uh, Louis Fry Richardson uh, suggested that uh, tens of thousands of computers working together could forecast the weather. Uh, so, but uh, in his vision, the computers were human beings, not computer processors. So you can see the vision here are tens of thousands of uh, people gathered in a large theater and computing the weather for uh, different regions of the earth. Well, the vision did become true, but instead of uh, human beings, uh, digital electronic computers are used. Uh, so here, P1 to P4 are um, computer processors or processing elements. And in reality, we have like uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these processors to forecast the weather. And uh, each processor is calculating the weather for one particular region, but now to calculate uh, uh, partial derivatives in the weather equations, these uh, processors need to exchange info with the neighbors. And well, this is really what HPC is about. This is a typical parallel computing problem. We have many processors and efficient network to uh, communicate uh, so the processors can exchange the results. Okay, so we have the laws of physics. Uh, we have large computers. Seems like the problem should be solved. We can uh, very well forecast the weather. Yes and no. So as you all know, probably the accuracy of the weather forecasts is still uh, rather limited. So here you can see how the accuracy of weather forecasts has improved in time. Uh, so today, five day forecast is as accurate as uh, two day forecast uh, was uh, like in 1980. And uh, there is a theoretical limit uh, for predictability of the atmosphere. And this is about uh, two weeks. This is because atmosphere is chaotic. What does it mean? We always have a small error in our forecast. In the initial conditions in our forecast model and this error will uh, quickly grow in time. So I will try to visualize that with this image on the left. So here you can see uh, 50 lines uh, in blue and in red. These are isohypsis. Well, airflow actually is parallel to these lines. And now if we run uh, a weather model on a supercomputer, uh, using these different initial conditions and look at daily output, you can see how in time uh, this uh, error will grow, the uncertainty will grow. And after one week uh, of simulation, this is now one week uh, weather forecast, uh, these lines are scattered around, see? so we don't know anymore from where the air is flowing into Estonia and we cannot provide very accurate uh, weather forecast anymore. 
So uh, predictability is limited due to laws of physics. So uh, some about my own work. Uh, so I have worked with uh, improving uh, the forecast uh, models, improving uh, the physics in the models. So here you can see a satellite image and here is a smoke cloud over Russia. And now we, we don't consider influence of the smoke in the weather forecast, we get this warm bias of multiple degrees compared to observations. But when accounting for the uh, influence of smoke, uh, then we can reduce this uh, bias. And uh, well, this is one option to improve the weather forecast, to improve the physics. Uh, another option is to collect more observations and improve the initial conditions. Uh, so now about uh, climate prediction. So actually uh, predicting the global climate is a somewhat more simple problem compared to weather prediction. This is because uh, global climate is determined by the balance between incoming uh, solar radiation here in yellow and outgoing thermal radiation here in orange. And uh, now if we add uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, uh, then uh, they absorb more thermal radiation and uh, we get global warming. So here on the right, you can see uh, dependence of uh, global temperature change on anthropogenic uh, CO2 emissions. So there is this clear dependence. Uh, well, this is true for the global climate. We have such a simple relationship. But if we want to capture the regional details, for example, how the climate will change in Estonia, uh, then in addition to this energy balance, we need to calculate all the movements in the atmosphere and distribution of this energy. So we will again need to run a model similar to weather models. And instead of running it for two weeks, we need to run it for a uh, hundred years or more. Uh, so how to improve the climate predictions? Actually, the climate models today are already very reliable, but there still are some uncertain aspects, um, especially some uh, physical processes are still uh, poorly understood. And one such pro process is clouds and impact of uh, air pollution particles on clouds. So here in this satellite image, you can see a track of polluted cloud uh, in otherwise uh, pristine uh, cloud deck. Uh, so I have taken these detailed uh, observations and uh, used these to improve a climate model. So I performed some um, uh, simulations with UK global climate model. And here you can see the response all in red meaning unidirectional cloud thickening, uh, but uh, the observations really show this uh, bidirectional response. Uh, so again, to improve the global climate models, we need detailed observations and improve physical understanding. Uh, but uh, what about uh, just uh, throwing in uh, more compute nodes and more processors. Well, this is possible as well. And this allows to capture more regional details by running higher resolution models. So here you can see 100 kilometer resolution compared to 10 kilometer resolution. And uh, this uh, higher resolution, we now see more details in Estonia. And high resolution models, for example, allow to simulate uh, such large storms like the one occurred uh, in Estonia in 2010. Uh, 
so why we need this uh, regional details? Of course, in terms of weather prediction, then we can better predict the uh, impacts, where it's going to happen, how strong it will be. And in terms of climate change, if we know how climate will change in Estonia, then we can make preparations for that. We can uh, make sure that in our infrastructure is ready for the changes in climate. So this was all about uh, uh, computations, uh, weather and climate models. But uh, these models and satellite observations also produce a lot of data. So today we're talking about uh, petabytes uh, of data, but uh, in near future exabytes uh, of data. And uh, we need a lot of computing resources also just to analyze these uh, data sets and outputs. Uh, so here is example again from my own work, some detailed satellite observations. So if you know what you're looking for, you can take just a small subset of the data. Here we use just some um, tens of terabytes of data uh, and uh, analyze the physical processes. But now if you want to analyze the full data sets, uh, then we cannot really afford uh, downloading uh, all this data, but it's much more efficient to do the processing close to the data. So to better illustrate that, uh, so we have some proposals uh, to analyze climate projections for Europe and uh, Estonia. And uh, the question is that uh, which computing resources to use uh, for this analysis. So again, it's uh, petabytes uh, of data. So probably the data download uh, to a rocket cluster, for example, would be too heavy. Uh, nowadays, there already are some specialized clouds and uh, HPCs, some computer clusters, uh, where you can apply for resources uh, to process this data where the data is already available. But what really seems to be the future is that uh, the climate data is quickly becoming available at uh, public major general cloud providers like Amazon, Google, uh, and uh, if the climate data is available there, then for users, it's uh, uh, easy to use the Amazon or Google resources to do the analysis there close to the data. For example, uh, NASA will use uh, soon Amazon Web Services uh, to host uh, its data. Okay, so uh, this was all about uh, atmosphere, but really the climate system, the Earth system, it consists of many spheres. So here you can see hydrosphere, cryosphere, biosphere, lithosphere, and uh, also anthroposphere. Uh, so uh, we want to simulate and analyze all these spheres. And uh, anthroposphere is now interactive part of all this. So we want to know what are the Mm, uh, impacts on uh, human systems and vice versa. We want to know how human activities influence the environment. So major uh, EU initiative and vision dealing uh, with the Earth system is a digital twin Earth. So this is like a digital copy of Earth. So first of all, we have all this uh, Earth system spheres, we want to simulate these spheres and collect observations for all these spheres. Uh, but uh, now there's also two other parts what's also very important. So first, full integration of policy sectors. So we want to know how the natural environment uh, impacts uh, our in infrastructure, for example, and we want to predict the impacts uh, in real time. 
And third, very important point is uh, open and interactive uh, access to all this big data. So not just only researchers could access and analyze all this data, but also non-expert users uh, could access, analyze and to make uh, better decisions. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for this uh, extremely interesting presentation. Uh, I see that there is one question in the Q&A window and the question is very challenging. Is there any any progress in predicting earthquakes? Uh, I'm sure there are, but uh, I'm not uh, an expert on this, so I cannot provide any details. Okay. <clears throat> then, um, uh, will the weather forecast be more accurate in 10 years, or is it not possible because of the laws of physics? Actually, you already said something about it, but never, but still, can you maybe uh, add something? <laughs> yeah, uh, so of course it will be uh, more accurate, uh, but it's kind of a quiet uh, evolution or quiet revolution. Uh, so uh, there's probably are not going to be like uh, steep increases in the accuracy. And uh, as I said, there is this physical limit of deterministic uh, predictability. This is two weeks. And as we get closer to this limit, it of course gets harder and harder to make better predictions. But, uh, but again, if we just uh, have more processors, larger supercomputers, uh, this allows to increase the resolution to simulate more processes and this allows to capture more local details. For example, we can pre better predict what the weather will be in Tartu, for example, in the future. Okay, thank you. Then there is one question from Kaur Alaso in chat. And the question goes, uh, is, is there a danger that uh, large companies, for instance, Google or Amazon, uh, will use the free hosting of data to lock in users to their environment. Uh. Yeah, so this is an excellent question. So I think vice versa is true. So um, instead of um, instead of like uh, having the monopoly, okay, okay, this 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 is a monopoly then, but. Uh, it's also a possibility to easily share all the workflows, what you Kaur talked about as well. So it brings a lot of new possibilities. Uh, so the workflows can be shared uh, on there using these platforms as well. So, but yeah, there are plus and minuses, but uh, uh, it really seems that pluses, pluses are bigger. So. Uh, it's it's not considered to um, be be a big problem, I think. Okay, thank you. Then maybe another question: uh, Do you believe that uh, more accurate uh, climate predictions can be translated into better political decisions or economical decisions? Yeah, another excellent question. So. Um, as I said, um, climate predictions today are already very reliable. And of course, in time, the climate researchers will improve the forecasts again. Uh, but today there is this uh, huge gap, like we have the physical understanding, uh, we have reliable predictions and we have uh, political decisions. Uh, so really the political decisions are well behind of our understanding. So the question really is more how to bring this physical understanding what we have into real decisions and uh, how to, how to uh, achieve uh, 
reductions in emissions. So it's, it's really like we also need contributions from experts in economics, from social scientists, etc. So we already have very good understanding and uh, it should be used better. I would answer like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we still have time for one final question. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that um, it is a technical challenge to analyze climate data because the amount of data is really huge. And uh, now let's imagine that somebody needs information on future climate conditions in Estonia. Um, is a person with uh, limited programming skills still able to extract such uh, information from public data sets or like? Yeah, uh, so the short answer is yes, it's, it's totally possible. Uh, although today it's still a technical challenge, but these, these uh, workflows and environments they are uh, very rapidly popping, popping up where you can do such analysis with little technical experience. But I think a much more um, uh, important issue is that, that this, all this data and workflows, uh, when you use these, you have to know what you're doing. Uh, so I have seen in many cases, this climate data is uh, used in a wrong way. So you need to know the uncertainty, you need to understand some climate physics to use this data. Uh, so um, really this expertise is needed. And well, we have such expertise in the Institute of Physics. So if somebody needs to analyze such data, I really encourage to contact us and be, feel free to contact me via email if you have any interest in using the data in your research or in some application. Okay, thank you very much. I can't see other questions in the Q&A window. Thanks a lot, well, once again. Um, and now, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving to our <clears throat> last pre presentation tonight. Um, the fastest supercomputer in the world is currently located in Japan. <clears throat> However, the situation may change this summer and uh, the world's fastest supercomputer may be located much closer to Estonia. <laughs> uh, a lot of people have already heard about the Lumi project uh, that has been launched in Finland but I'm sure not everyone has heard about it yet. So our <clears throat> last speaker tonight is from Finland, uh, Pekka Manninen from the Lumi supercomputing facility. Welcome Pekka, uh, glad to have you here tonight. Please tell us what is Lumi and how it improves the level of computing performance. Thank you, that is my uh intention so uh good evening everybody presentation so uh indeed i'm pekka Manninen. i'm the head of the lumi computing facility and uh today i'm going to introduce to the um uh lumi or plan spot for the lumi supercomputer and uh also its relevance to estonia so it's a it's just not a show of, of, of the computer, but also the, that may be beneficial for the uh, Estonian research com community. And um, <clears throat> the story of Lumi starts back in uh, 2018, when the European Commission uh, uh, woke up to the fact that uh, European Union is falling behind on this kind of a tip of the iceberg supercomputer, so something we call Tier Zero. In Europe, we do have a uh, strong tradition in computational science on many scientific disciplines, and also like a pretty credible scientific computing infrastructure. So we have most of the European, uni uh, European universities do have a credible tier two systems like you have in, in, in Tartu. Uh, and uh, most European countries have uh, also um, like a, 
credible tier one, this kind of a national level supercomputer systems uh, we have used to uh, run in, in at that CSC. However, this this kind of a, like a tier zero computers uh, uh, have been a little bit lacking. Uh, we do have typically have one or two entries in the top ten in the in the in the world, but the Euro European Commission wanted to uh, change this this uh, power balance what comes to the largest supercomputers and a race to the something we call exascale supercomputers. And hence they uh, established EuroHPC joint undertaking initiative, where the union and the uh, member country resources are, are being pooled for uh, for the acquisition and provision of a world-class supercomputing and data infrastructure for basically all uh, research in, in, in Europe, uh, both in academia and, and in the private sector. And it's, it's also a funding agency for uh, HPC and AI related uh, research. So it's, it's been uh, signed by, or the, it's joined by uh, 32 countries uh, from the union and uh, associate countries. And it's been a pretty fast train in the sense that already uh, back in summer uh, 2019, it announced the first generation of the of the uh, this jointly uh, procured systems. So phase three will what they called precursors to exascale or pre-exascale for short would go to uh, Finland, Italy, and Spain, and five small but uh, smaller uh, smaller but not smaller sorry uh, systems to um, to uh, elsewhere in in Europe. And uh, it has an it's going to be a long, long uh, program with the also plans for the next generation systems and next, next generation of systems. Uh, it, when basically it came topical to uh, that we would we would have a facility and the competence to host one of these systems in in, in Kajaani in northern Finland. Uh, but it kind of like a turn out pretty soon that we won't ever have the matching uh, national funding for the system. So we started to uh, build up a consortium uh, for a joint uh, investment and operations of the system. So it is not a uh, finished project by no means, but it's, it's, an, uh, it's, a, it's a joint effort of 10 countries in, in here in the map. So, so from the uh, Nordics and, and, and then from Central Europe, uh, Estonia included. And uh, where we just uh, pull pull money and uh, and uh, just make decisions to, together and host this uh, system in in, in a co collaborative fashion, and in exchange of these investments, each of the country get the corresponding share of the of the um, of, of Lumis resources, basically CPU uh, cycles. And uh, so, fifty percent of the share is is paid by the uh, Euro SPC joint undertaking meaning that one half of the resources will be available for everybody in Europe to apply. And the one half of the, from the consortium uh, is reserved for the, for the consortium countries in the, in the map, allocated by their own considerations. So that's why LUMI, the Estonian LUMI resources will be part of your uh, national uh, portfolio for granting access to these uh, kind of a tier zero systems for those kind of research that that's needs the uh, extreme computing power. Uh, and uh, the Lumi consortium itself was, was a very strong part of the uh, story. So it was the first time in, in, in European scientific, uh, like a science political history, that uh, 10 countries invest together in, in uh, hardware or computer hardware outside their country borders. Uh, and another part of the uh, success story here was, was this uh, location in, in Kajani. And I think this was also how we got, uh, we convinced also our consortium partners that it's, it's a, in fact, pretty good deal, deal to invest on this system. And uh, uh, Lumi will be located in, in a former paper mill. So the paper production is, as, as you know, it is long, long time, ago, time ago, went to somewhere in Latin America, but the uh, factories remain. And uh, as Google did in, in a Hamina factory, we in, back in 2010 or so, we decided to uh, also um, uh, locate our own data center in in an uh, paper machine or paper mill that, that was taken down in the mid uh, 2006 or 2008 or something like this. 
And uh, we've been running here at the national systems for, for quite some time and we've been very happy with the uh, site. And Lumi will be now going to the other end of the, of the factory. And uh, it started off with this kind of like a huge empty hall. The paper machine was demolished and uh, sold as a spare parts or something like that. But at, uh, we are building this kind of a building, building within a building, so two-story data center to the end of the one end of this, this big hall. And the benefits for, for running the system here are quite uh, are obvious. So uh, the paper machine used to consume 230 megawatts of energy. So the 10 megawatt supercomputer is, is pretty peanuts for the, for the site. Um, it, uh, the power comes in so many directions because the paper machines couldn't go down. So basically there has been one electricity outbreak in, in, during my lifetime in the, in the, uh, on the uh, site. Uh, we can do free cooling throughout the year, and but this time we are in, in fact not uh, uh, like uh, uh, letting it out from the windows, but in fact collecting it and uh, heating up the 20% of the Kayane city, uh, surrounding Kayane city with, with this uh, kind of uh, excess or waste heat of the, of the Lumi supercomputer. And get in fact money back from the uh, energy company for, the, for that one. Uh, it may be remote, but it is very well connected. It's just part of the uh, Nordic internet backbone, and uh, there will be a very uh, high-speed uh, network between EE, uh, EENet and uh, and Funet for for the data transmission from Estonia to Kajaani. And uh, then what it is? Uh, well, it. For sure, it will be one of the fastest supercomputers in the, in the world. So uh, if you would install it, if it would be online today, so the picture here and on my background there is still, unfortunately, an artist impression. So the system is still in the, in the manufacturer, or oh, it's still in, in, a, in a factory in, in Chippewa Falls, and not in Kajani, unfortunately. But uh, uh, if it would be online today, it would be, in fact, fastest by the big performance as compared to the uh, Japanese system and, uh, and uh, more than two times faster than the second fastest system in the, in the States. Uh, I don't think that will be any more the case when, when Lumi finally becomes online at the end of this year, but uh, it will be among the top, uh, top five, even top three systems in the, in, in the world. And uh, so this 550 petaflops or time, 550 times 10 to the power uh, 15 floating point operations per second, translates to some like uh, one and a half million uh, MacBook Pros. Uh, but uh, of course, they, it won't do the job of, of those laptops and vice versa, but just give them some kind of an uh, indication. But uh, more importantly, it's, it's going to be a modern platform for uh, this decades, high performance computing and, and simulation science, uh, machine learning and high performance data analytics and especially how to converge them in the same, for the same uh, scientific pro uh, problem. If we want to be a little bit more technical or a little bit more petabytes and, and, and flops, this is the uh, Lumis architecture. So it's going to consist of this uh, very big, uh, well, not in terms of nodes, but in terms of performance, uh, GPU partition based on the AMD's next-gen uh, GPUs. It's going to have a, like a supplementary CPU resources of some uh, 1500 uh, CPU nodes, 200,000 uh, CPU cores in, in general, and uh, uh, like a very big um, shared memory partition for, for uh, extreme scale visualization and uh, data analytics meshing, so on, so on. And the storage will be based on, on three layers. So there will be a big uh, pool of, of, of flash or SSDs. Uh, some 80 petabytes of, of, of like a spinning disk luster, more traditional parallel file system. Uh, and uh, then this kind of object storage service based on Ceph technology for uh, stitching in, stitching out data uh, and uh, sharing the data sets to the outside world and things like this. And everything sitting nicely together within the same uh, fabric and uh, so sharing the same login environment uh, share every, uh, the storage environment and so on. Uh, like I said, the system will be eventually uh, online at the end of uh, this year or available for users early uh, 22. 
uh, before that we have finished the system procurement uh, last last fall uh, the data center or the this kind of a snow bank looking like uh, data center is uh, now ready to host the systems we're going to start the uh, physical installations in Kayane later later this spring just that the first phase which is everything besides the big GPU partition will be uh, opened in, in the uh, after summer break and then basically immediately starting the uh, installation of the second phase and like I said the system will be in full, full glory at the end of the year and, uh, and uh, or beginning of, of next year and uh, uh, just some scientific uh, you know uh, connections here so why do we build this these systems are not for competing against other big systems but really to enable uh, breakthrough science and uh, Lumi itself has been designed and has this kind of design goal of, of an uh, Swiss army knife where you can pull up some kind of a, like a, a corkscrew for pretty all workflows that the uh, scientists of this uh, can, can uh, come up with on the, in the current decade i.e. for wide spectrum of use cases and, and user communities. But if I need to mention something that basically needs this kind of a level of resources are, are like just uh, very uh, presented in the, in the very interesting presentation before me uh, is, is to uh, understand uh, or make the uh, climate science into the level on, on what if scenarios. So being able to uh, ask, ask uh, the impact what, for different kind of measures. So uh, combining different uh, models, so uh, atmospheric models to land models to ocean models and so on, and also to analyze, uh, make make this kind of a what if scenarios. And these are known this uh, digital twins, and that is a big European project of Destination Earth starting up. And on, on these, the um, <clears throat> pre scale systems will have a big role. Uh, also, the computational medicine that we have been talking about will, will be a, a big use case for, um, for the uh, pre-scale machines. So we uh, apply uh, large-scale uh, full genome sequ sequencing to uh, like a other data sets and uh, make, make this kind of a, like a very large-scale correlations. Uh, it's going to be and Lumi. It's going to be an, uh, one of the leading platforms for for uh, AI, especially uh, training deep neural networks. And uh, they can be then in turn analyzing and reanalyzing uh, either very big simulated data sets or observational data sets in, in many uh, fields of science. Uh, we can do like a groundbreaking applied AI, be it on on self driving vehicles or, or natural language processing. Uh, but nonetheless, by combining very big data sets to the extreme uh, read uh, capabilities or IO capabilities into extreme compute capabilities will be a key for many uh, like a breakthroughs in, in, in the AI as applied. Uh, of course, data analytics in, in terms of, of uh, understanding, uh, dunning or mining uh, human behavior patterns from, from uh, say, social media data. And uh, is this going to be a uh, use case of this emerging digital humanities? And uh, one, one important uh, factor for the, for the big supercomputers in, in the Euro SPC will be this urgent computing where we can just like a, uh, socialize a machine for, for, an, uh, for this kind of a time or mission critical uh, computing of which the uh, understanding the COVID pandemic is, is a prime example on, on where we could uh, just like a put the, put the uh, combined uh, computing power in the world to uh, tackle or uh, find, find cures and then that uh, understanding the uh, virus. Um, let me uh, start concluding by noting that uh, how one could then prepare for, for Lumi. Like I said, uh, Lumi will be in your disposal as well. So I leave the details on, on how to get an access to, the, to my Estonian colleagues to answer. Uh, but uh, just the key message is, is that the Lumi will be in your, uh, uh, in, in your use later this year. 
So one could think about projects for, for Lumi. So what are these kind of a, like a grand challenge, computational challenges that could be some like a, some kind of a simulation or some kind of analytics that hasn't been done before. So now they would be kind of a, like a, a very good chance of, of running something for the first time in the in in world. Or uh, in a way modernizing uh, the, uh, the workflow in a sense that you could like uh, apply uh, this uh, well, partly hyped, but about partly extremely powerful uh, machine learning methods into the uh, more traditional simulated data. Uh, noting, however, that Lumi's extreme computing power will not come from uh, like a very, very large set, set of uh, CPUs, but uh, very packed uh, computing, uh, compute density based on GPU processors. Uh, and that they need code enabling, uh, some code enabling work. But uh, fortunately, it's not a hero programming anymore on the in the, uh, this in the 2021 uh, time frame. In, instead, uh, all major supercomputers now, uh, now and in, especially in the future will be GPU based. So in order to ride the wave of the tier zero systems, basically uh, one just needs to have a GPU enabled code. For instance, all these three uh, EuroHPC pre-X systems are GPU-based systems. Uh, so either seeing whether this, this already is an existing uh, package of, of uh, using GPUs uh, or doing the uh, biting bullet and, and, uh, and uh, doing the enabling work yourself. In, in any case, just uh, modernizing uh, scientific applications and, uh, and uh, making the GPU enablements will, will uh, just uh, pay off. So even if it works, it's maybe good time to fix the code. So basically, that's what I had in mind for, for this seminar. So uh, there will be kind of a golden age for scientific computing, uh, big scale data analytics starting up in, in Europe uh, from this uh, commission led EuroHPC effort. So there will be basically unprecedented amount of computational resources for everybody in, in Europe, uh, or all EU countries. And uh, not only that, but complemented by competence building and, uh, and uh, user support activities uh, with a good example of this uh, Euro HPC competence centers that, that uh, Ular was, was mentioning. Uh, and uh, we are building together this uh, Lumi supercomputer in, in, in Kajani. Uh, it's going to be a leadership class resource for, for a broad range of user communities and, uh, and uh, use cases uh, where we really pay attention to the user experience and uh, kind of like a, with, with the notion that uh, it's going to be based on, on GPUs, meaning uh, that some code uh, enabling work will be uh, needed. Uh, it's online at the end of the year, so it is a good time for start preparing for it. So. Uh, Thank you for your attention. I know it's only me between you and your evening meal. So, uh, but if, if you got interested in Lumi, uh, find us from the internet on, on Lumi uh, supercomputer.eu. Uh, there are some social media accounts that uh, don't really, uh, well, you follow, follow them. I uh, have not, not really involved myself, uh, but if you want to contact me directly, free, feel free to uh, drop me an email or, or give me a call. And, uh, Thank you, and I think I have time for some, some questions. Thank you, Becca. Thank you for this fantastic uh, overview. Um, maybe <clears throat> some questions <laughs> as you are here. Um, who will actually be able to access Lumi? I mean, is it available only for the member countries of Lumi Consortium or also for Asians, Africans, or <laughs> maybe? So, um, yes, uh, yes, so, so the PI, so the uh, project and the, and, the, and the principal investigator needs to be basically European. So the, if you are from the Lumi Consortium countries or the 10 countries, you can uh, apply either from the national resources that for instance, in, in uh, Estonian PI can apply for a project from the either from the Estonian side or mm -hmm. from the commission side. Uh, so PI needs to be either, either from the Lumi Consortium countries or wider from the, uh, from the uh, Euro HPC, 32 Euro HPC countries. However, uh, these PIs have uh, 
within some limitations, are able to invite also collaborators into their project. So that's, that's, that, is, that, that is a way of, of getting uh, like an international collaboration for, for the project. And then uh, with the kind of a being the PI being in charge and, uh, and accountable, they can invite the uh, users into their projects uh, outside of, of, the, of, of Europe. Okay, thank you. Then, uh, <clears throat> uh, how many people are there in Lumi team? I mean, uh, technical stuff, uh, uh, support team, and so on. It should uh, require a lot of stuff to to build and and maintain uh, such uh, machinery. Uh, believe it or not, but this, this is in fact quite scalable, in a sense that they uh, so so they this I don't know it's a kind of a logarithmic or in any. In uh, the the person effort, so basically these these uh, big installations are quite cost efficient in in a sense that it's not much bigger effort than than uh, maintaining say a tier, tier one system. So on the Lumi team, so uh, they, they will be directly on the, on the Lumi's budget. There is basically uh, a handful, say six seven sys admins, and then there's this ten person uh, Lumi user support team that's spread across the consortium. So, so there will be one member in each of these Lumi consortium countries uh, that uh, are the frontline support for the for the users and do this kind of proactive measures like providing training, keeping the documentation, maintaining the software stack, and uh, things like this. So that uh, those so on the on the directly on this this budget test, there's like a less than twenty people involved. Of course, there's uh, like a peripherals the the Competence centers will be on most con consortium countries supporting the uh, the effort. We have a like a handful of stuff from the system vendor Cray. Uh, so there's some sys admins, three sys admins, and uh, and uh, four uh, like application specialists working for Lumi and things like this. So, but it's, we are still talking about, but uh, surprisingly, uh, li uh, like a compact number of, of people. Okay, thank you. Then there are some questions in. Uh, let's start with the uh, questions in chat. Uh, there's a question from from Kau Ralaso who wants to know how easy it is to make code portable between GPU and CPU environments. Can you comment on that? Um, so it's going to need some effort. So so uh, we need to. Sometimes algorithmic changes are needed, so it's, it's a massively parallel system where we can, uh, where we basically just like a, uh, always subscribe the the core or the CPU or the so the, the processor unit there with with like a billions of threads basically. So more parallelizable or kind of a loosely coupled, more powerful, it's just so easy to get it to a GPU. And the pro program model wise, uh, I mean they are like a native. A way it is a, on NVIDIA GPUs is called CUDA, mm -hmm. and and AMD has its three implementation of CUDA called HIP. Or one can can also give a try on on and taking an existing CPU code and then using a different kind of a directives uh, with uh, OpenMP to uh, offload the computer, computational kernels to the GPU, and then it, it's basically orchestrated by by the uh, CPU. So that's uh, two two ways. Or there are different kind of frameworks on top of it, which you can just like uh, write your own, own algorithms. So uh, it's an effort depends of the algorithm, uh, the kind of a how big code you ask. And of course, like uh, having an uh, ten thousand line in-house code is, is an entirely different effort than an uh, twenty million lines weather code. So I mean, it depends depends on also on the on the code that you are working with. Okay, thank you. Then. Um... Two questions appear in the Q and A window. Uh, there is one philosophical question about the role of quantum computing in near future. I don't know whether this is actually. Can you answer to that, or <laughs> uh, perhaps the pe people may have observed there, but there was like a gray box on the on the on the on the snowflake saying Lumi Q, which is an uh, it said emerging tech, and that the Q is is I don't know, it's just, uh, not very uh, perhaps uh, hard to guess whether this the Q stands for. So we do have an uh, um, 
aspirations of adding quantum computing as, as a uh, capability for, for Lumi. But uh, quantum computing will be, um, it's, uh, I would compare it to the uh, like a supercomputers or mainframe computers in the early 60s at the moment. So, so it is in uh, the kind of like a first step. So of course, as we have gone through the uh, history of computers already, so we can accelerate the progress with, with uh, quantum computers and making quantum computers useful. Uh, but uh, it, at the moment, it's, it's a kind of a, like a research done with the quantum computer. The, I guess the novelty comes from being able to quantum compute something rather than uh, finding really the quantum uh, uh, supremacy on, on the problem. But however, I think uh, within the next, next couple of years, we're going to see more and more uh, of these uh, cases where we uh, compute something on the existing quantum computers that is not uh, tractable with, with uh, Lumi or any other supercomputer. Great, thanks. A um, few more questions appeared into Q&A window. Johan Ernitz from Taltec University uh, wants to know, what is your experience in portating CUDA-based GPGPU code over to MROC OpenCL? <laughs> uh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> uh, no, it's not. Uh, so, so mainly the good is the, is the NVIDIA uh, native um, program model for GPUs. The people have been programming for nearly ten years now, and uh, and, uh, and and the uh, Rockum. Uh, uh, is this the AMD's Radeon Open Compute uh, stack? Uh, that where this this re-implementation of CUDA where it's basically search and replace on 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 an, uh, of CUDA. Uh, I'm let's say I'm positively surprised. So there's this automatized tool of code known as Hippify existing already. So Hippifying a code is is my well, our experience is something like uh, it may be zero percent of the code uh, needs to be changed. So it's basically uh, goes goes directly in. Or the, the kind of a worst case scenario is, is that uh, so something like a forty percent of the lines of code needs to need to some manual interference. But uh, in in general, so it's uh, uh, surprisingly uh, straightforward, especially if you're talking about uh, codes that don't do not employ the latest and greatest CUDA features, but are kind of a more down to earth CUDA. So uh, at the moment, so it's the putting uh, effort from CUDA to heap is is uh, it is uh, surprisingly straightforward. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's take a final question. HPC and cryptocurrency mining, is there any relation between those two? <laughs> I, I could truly hope not. So, so uh, this is definitely not the use case for, for HPC systems. And, uh, and it's like a, uh, yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's a not, 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 not a new use, it's, it's a basically like a just like a hindrance in, in a way that we need to, uh, Keep keep those out on the on the systems and uh, and uh, those those uh, efforts are making the components more expensive for for, for the public usage and, uh, and in general uh, cryptocurrencies are something that we in a few years we have noticed we have uh, warmed up our decrease for for uh, and well climate for one degree and then uh, crashed our economical system for for this idea so, so great uh, thank you Becca for this really comprehensive presentation and. And uh, the time is 7.15, which means that we have successfully reached the end of the seminar. Uh, thank you once again for being with us tonight. The recording of the seminar will be available soon. And my last uh, announcement today is that the next data seminar takes place already in May. Uh, stay tuned for more information. And that is all for today. Have a nice evening, everyone. Bye-bye.